Today is the 22nd of May, 2018. We're at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? What do you want me to do, Wayne? Um, please state your full name and date and place of birth. Okay. Name is Harold C. Kenyon. <clears throat> I was born 3-13-28. And whereabouts were you born? I was born in Burlington, Vermont, and raised in a little village called Bristol, Vermont. All right. And you attended school there? I went to I went elementary, and then I went through. I eventually graduated from Bristol High School. Eventually, we'll cover that as we go. Along. Okay. Was that after the war? Uh, it was uh, up through my junior year. Was uh, in 1946. Okay. All right. I forego forgave my senior year in high school to enlist in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And I enlisted on the 2nd of October. Now, why did you pick the Marine Corps? Why did I pick it? I was infatuated by the Marine Corps because I followed their adventures from Guadalcanal on through I see. on through the war, and uh, okay, I never really knew anybody when I was growing up that was a Marine. Uh -huh. But I was that I was just as a kid growing up. The Marine Corps seemed to me be something special. Mm -hmm. Now, was your dad in uh, World War One? My you? dad was in the Army, World War One, okay. in Germany. Okay, and uh, spoke very little of it. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, the only thing I knew that after the war, my father was an MP in Paris. Outside of that, he never talked uh, about his time in in, uh, in World War One in Europe. Okay. So you you enlisted in the Marine Corps. I enlisted on the second of October and went to Paris Island uh -huh. for my boot camp training. And was that your first time basically away from home for you? Uh, pretty much. And from after three months of boot camp, I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and was enrolled in their basic engineering school. Mm -hmm. uh, that took me into 1947. And when I came out of the engineering school, I came out with I, my spec number made me a, a demolition specialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that year in 1947, the Marine Corps came out with a memo. If you had 27 months left on your uh, enlistment, you could apply for a tour of duty two years in the Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. And there were four of us that had become slightly friendly, decided to apply. I had to extend my enlistment as they did one year, 12 months, in mm -hmm. order to have 27 months left on my enlistment. And lo and behold, we were accepted in that that program of, of a tour in Western Pacific mm -hmm. for two years. We were sent home on leave. I went home to Bristol for, I believe it was 15 days, and then reported to Treasure Island, California, mm -hmm. which was the base of the Golden Gate Bridge. It was there that we were notified that we were going to North China. We boarded a, a German, or a German, an Army transport mm -hmm. troop ship took us to Honolulu, Okinawa, and eventually to Guam. There were only 30 Marines on it. The rest were all Army personnel. Uh, we didn't have any problem. Uh, things went well. And when we got to Guam, we flew from there to Tsingtao, North China. Mm -hmm. Went on a transport plane and landed on 
on the Marine Air Base, which is just north of the city. Uh, that's when we found our new home. We were transported to what had been at one time a German university, and they call it uh, Long Chung, a long, long tongue. It was a small university, mm -hmm. and the Marine Corps had taken it over. It had dormitories, which there were line troops in, classrooms, uh, administrative offices, and it had a beautiful outside amphitheater. Now, the Marine Corps had expanded that a lot uh, before I got there. They took one section of it and made and put Quonset huts in. And that's where I was housed. It was on one end of the, of the university. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, and we were what was known at that time as an engineer company. They also had another piece that they had done some work with uh, where our administrative buildings were, our motor pool, and a large butler hut which housed our plumbing, electricity, and refrigeration and work, work area. I had no sooner landed and, and got seated uh, in St. Tao, and I was called in and told there was absolutely no need for a demolition specialist. But what they desperately needed at the time was a refrigeration person. Because the person who was handling that uh, department was going back to the States to be discharged. Mm -hmm. And he would give me a crash course on refrigeration. And he did that. It was in the winter. I worked with him during the day learning the refrigeration business. We call that in the Marine Corps reefer business. We worked on reefers. That's what it was a brief. Uh, name for refrigeration. Mm -hmm. I worked on that during the day and and just consumed all the knowledge I could in the evening in regards to the manuals and what I was going to be working with. And then I was notified as to what my job would be. On the base there were seven 600 foot cubic walk-in coolers. One was near, nearly a, uh, uh, you know, a frozen capacity, and uh, the rest of walk-ins are made by the cor uh, Carrier Corporation. Mm -hmm. And I would be responsible for those seven. Out on the sea, on the coastline, were where the officers and their wives lived in villas. And they had they had uh, Chinese power, but their refrigerators were called Cervell refrigerators. They still make them. And those Cervells ran on kerosene because the Chinese power was 50 cycle and the American equipment was 60 cycle. I remember a colonel coming to me after I was there it brought his refrigerator from the States. He burned out the motor in it in two weeks. So I had to locate another one on the black market. But nonetheless, the Savelles were kerosene operators and they were a heat element, almost like the old fashioned Western movies where you looked at a lamp, mm -hmm. you know, they had a light, they had a wick in them. But they, they put a heat underneath and they were in the bottom of the refrigerator and the kerosene with that wick, and that wick heated an element on the bottom of that refrigerator, which contributed to the cooling of the refrigerator. The only problem they had maintenance-wise was that the Chinese help forgot to fill a two-gallon tank, and they would burn the wick. Mm -hmm. And I would have to go out there and service them, put a new wick in and, and adjust it. I think there were 12 of our Savelle refrigerators out on that uh, coastline villa. Uh, I found out from my grandson 
Sabal still makes that kerosene operated uh, refrigerator because it can be used for camping and uh -huh. where there's no electricity. Well, I had that and I had some work in what we call a mess hall. It was a place where you could go down and get a beer in the evening. And I had a couple of coolers in there that I had to take care of. Now, as far as taking care of, what exactly did you have to do with those? Maintenance, repair, and the, the big one was those seven uh, walk-ins mm -hmm. because they handle all of our refrigerated food at our mess hall for all of the all of the people who were in that compound. Now, did they break down very often? Oh, they were a real challenge. When the guy had left, he left in the winter. And uh, when the warm weather came, instead of seven, I had five that worked. So I had to make sure that they were working. They were on, in those days, refrigeration was on a, on a gas of ammonia and carbon dioxide gas. It killed you if you got a smell of it. And those five had to be fine-tuned constantly. Two were out of operation. And one, once I learned the business, I converted two of them to Freon. That's the gas used that we have in our refrigeration today. I converted two of those because they were adjustable in regards to the, the cooling and making a mechanism work. And as time went on that I was there, I converted those other five to Freon. But it, if you made an adjustment on what they call the expansion valve, you had to wait 24 hours to see if that adjustment went into effect. They were very fine tuning, but I had all seven of them running by the time I left there. Down in the city, there was an officer's club for single enlist, uh, single officers. Out on the coast, there were families, you know, a husband and wife, and they had some children. They also had four, what we call, clubs for PFCs, corporals, and sergeants. And they were run on American generators because they could not use Chinese power. They had reefers, refrigerators in them that I was responsible for. They were a pretty large unit, but they kept all of their food that needs to be refrigerated in those things. And I was on call 24-7 because if one of those went down, those, those clubs were in trouble because they were open 24 hours a day. If you belonged to the Corporal's Club, you were allowed to go to that club. It had a bar, it had a uh, restaurant, and it had a, a, I don't call it a living room, a lounge, because there was no television in those mm -hmm. days, where you could either go to listen to music, play cards, read, whatever, and relax. No women were allowed in those clubs. Uh, on top of that, if you were a corporal, you were allowed to go to the corporal's club. If you were a sergeant, you could go to the sergeant's club and you could go to the corporal's club. But a corporal could not go to a sergeant's club. Mm -hmm. that, that was the rules and regulations. I, I had my own jeep and it was in a heating area and a motor pool. And they, if they needed me, they'd wake me up one or two o'clock in the morning and take me by Jeep up to pick my vehicle up to go do the services, whether it was at the Bella or one of the private clubs. Uh, if they needed me at the mess hall, it was close to me, they'd send a guy up, we got a problem. And I would go get my equipment and do the servicing. The one thing about the clubs that was great for me, in China, it was a rarity to get American steak. Mm -hmm. uh, the only steak you got out of Navy had a fork facility down in the harbor, and once in a while, the clubs got small steaks. And if I went down there in the, in the, 
in the in the hours of the morning, they would feed me, and once in a while, I'd get a small piece of steak. The special meal, whether you went into the city or you were there, uh, the best one was a small steak and eggs. Where we have two eggs, if we want two eggs up for breakfast, their eggs were smaller. It took six, the equivalent of the two eggs. But nonetheless, they fed me and they took very good care of me. But I was on call 24-7. Now what but, rank were you? Huh? What rank were you? I was at that time, went from a PC, a PV, uh, P, PFC to a corporal. I had open gate 24-7. I didn't have, you know, the jeep had a uh, uh, pass on it. I, I went in and out of the, that gate anytime I want. I, you know, that was, I was almost like my own boss. Uh, I had a work area and a butler up, screened in, and I had a Chinese coolie that I was teaching the menial uh, responsibilities of refrigeration. You know, he was. He helped me with this and that and so forth. Uh, that butler hut, we had about 30 coolies in it. They came up out of the city. They were plumbers, electricians, and people of that nature. And they, I was fascinated at what they could do, ingenuity-wise. And they worked in the work area. Uh, did they have much to do with me? because there wasn't anything that they needed, but they did welding, they did electric work, they were amazing. The biggest thing I remember they're doing, we brought in barrel, 55 gallon drums of tar, and they rigged the thing up across, up from the boiler room, where they heated those barrels of tar, poured them into a, a what was a locker room off of a ship, and made a, had a ship, I uh, had a uh, uh, truck made up with a tank on it, and they blacked off all of the roads in that uh, university. Otherwise, they were dirt and mud in the spring. And they did all of it. Uh, they were, they, that uh, tanker they made up was ingenious. You know, they poured that hot tire into it, yep. went out, and and did those roads. They could do anything. I was absolutely amazed at the ingenuity of the Chinese people that worked with us there. Anyway, that's the first thing that happened to me when I got this thing up. I was busy and I was excited about it. I learned the business, trial and error. The second half thing happened to me, Wayne, was a sergeant came to me from the Art Marine Motor Pool. He was going back to the States. He had a houseboy, and he was not allowed, the Marine Corps would not allow him to take the boy back. Plus, the Chinese said he's not leaving. So he knew that I was there for two years, mm -hmm. and uh, he wanted me to take up the responsibility of this houseboy. And it was an amazing story and a sad one. He was 12 years old. He was affectionately known to all of us as Jingle Bells. The sergeant had found him on a Christmas Eve in 46 or 47, down starving on the streets in the city, attempting to sing Jingle Bells in broken English. He took him back to his barracks, and the rest was more or less what I inherited. He was going to an Amer American school in the university. The wives of the officers ran an American school mm -hmm. in the university for their, their children, and we paid a slight a fee for our, the, the Chinese kids to go to the school to learn English. And the one night, uh, I've got a, a Jingle Bells was slight of frame. He wasn't a very big kid, but he was extremely intelligent. Wasn't an athlete. But uh, he was a bookworm. He loved American history. And by the time I left, he 
he probably spoke better English than most of the Marines. He learned two languages. He was that intelligent. He had a bunk next to me. We cut their clothes down, and there were two other uh, houseboys or, or guardians, whatever you want to call them, in that same company with us. So they had he had friends there, and I they tell me there were a total of twenty of those kids that were in that in the marine marine compound. But anyway, Jingle Bells was next to me. He had a cot. He had cut down marine clothes and. Uh, he was a little 12-year-old Marine. Mm -hmm. Went to school every day, and in the summer, when it, he didn't go to school, he hung around with the other, uh, other boys. In that uh, area where we were up, was on the side of a cliff, we had a laundry and a cobbler shop. And it was it, one of his responsibilities was to take our laundry up because the Chinese ran it and they would launder our clothes and our uh, our clothing and uh, bag it for us at a very minimal price, and you could get shoe repair and so forth. There was an armory. All of our weapons were in that quonsida. They were not allowed in our quonsida because they thought occasionally they were broken into. So they had a quonsida with all of our weapons under lock and key, with two guys lived there 24-7. If an emergency came up and we had to get our weapon, we had to go to that Quonsada to get it. Otherwise, there were no weapons in our Quonsada. One other Quonsada housed a couple of Marines and was our post office. That's where we went to get our mail. Mm -hmm. So that little locale where our company was all a little self-contained place. Jingle Bells went to, went to school. He was a great little kid. I took him about everywhere I went. Anyway, in 1948, and I've got some stuff here, I found out that the Marine Corps had a six-team football program. They played them down in what we call the flats in, in uh, St. Tal was highly organized by Marine officers who had played football in college. Officials, beautiful field, the best of equipment, and so forth. So I applied. I went down and see if I could make one of those teams, and I made what was known in those days as the H and S Battalion, Headquarters and Service, and I made the team. I could run and I could catch. I started out as a tight end and ended up as a running back. Those had the minimal bleachers, good field, and the one thing that was amazing, we played on Saturday afternoons. That field was lined with Chinese people. They loved American football. And they, you know, if they remembered, knew our number on our jersey, we were heroes. Mm -hmm. To them, we were Americans playing football. Well, it was a great experience. And I've often, I've often, often been asked about it. Uh, it was highly organized. I played four years of college football. And I look back at those days between my time in college and my football in North China. We were just as well organized in China as we were in my college experience. That's how well organized the officers made of that, mm -hmm. of that football program. So I enjoyed that tremendously uh, that year. So that was a great experience. The amphitheater, where we was, they, brought, they had films at night in the summer, Pathé News. I remember watching a fight, fight, a fight of Tony Zale fighting somebody they'd sent over. We got, we got movies and that type of thing, but it was a pretty nice amphitheater, all out of marble and so forth. You could go down there in the evening and relax and watch what was there around the screen after it got dark. Now, what was, uh, what was your unit called? What was the numerical we, designation? Uh, I was considered in the 1st Marine Division. Mm -hmm. 
and we were what was known as the first battalion, engineer battalion, in uh, in North in Saint Tao, North China. Okay. Now, the the Marines had three divisions were in that area. One time they had the third Marine division, and they had the sixth Marine division. I happened to be in the first. A lot of those third and sixth came from Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Okinawa, Guam out of World War II. They're the ones that laid the groundwork for that whole place. We were a compound, a marine, a, we were a, an American base in North China. Down on the, uh, down on the harbor was a naval facility called the Port Authority. They had a couple teams in that, in that football league. Uh, it was a, it was some kind of a special experience. Anyway, Wayne, that goes through pretty well into 48. We were aware that the Red Chinese Army was coming out of the north mm -hmm. and moving south. Chiang Kai-shek was the big shot in China in those days. He was General Chiang Kai-shek. We went in, to, it was after the football season, we got word that there was going to be a change. The Red Chinese were coming down out of the North Country, out of Manchurian County. First word we got of it is, the Marine Corps came to us and told us we were going to have to give up our Chinese boys. They were going to be taken to St. Michael's Cathedral and turned over to the nuns, which was a heartbreaking experience for all of us. They set a date that they had to be taken up to the church. This is a big, it was a big cathedral, big Catholic church. I had a jeep, of course. They took them down into the, into the compound, loaded the young Marines on it, they're going up there on a Sunday afternoon. I took jingle bells in my Jeep and drove up to the church. There was a playground out there and we all congregated out there. And of course, we had our young people all dressed up in Marine uniforms, greens. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked like little Marines. A nun came out, said that they were being enrolled in Dunbar, uh, school. It was a parochial Catholic school. And they were going to take the kids in and show them their, where they were going to live and so on and so forth. So the kids went inside. We still had not said goodbye to them. They went inside and they were in quite a while. And out came the nuns and one of them came up to me and handed me Jingle Bell's clothing. He no longer needs this. He now has a Dunbar uniform, which was practically a cheesecloth that the, uh, that the Chinese wore. And we, in no uncertain terms, were ever attempt to communicate with them again. Now, why was that? Huh? Do you know why? They were to be separated totally from the Marine Corps. Mm. And we were, you know, we were stunned. I, I had never got to hug the little guy and, and say goodbye. We talked about it, but never thought it would come to that. He said, ah, we just figured he'd go to the school and occasionally we could go up and visit. Sure. Uh-uh. They cut, they severed the, they severed our relation with it. And we all went back stunned. We were broken hearted. No sooner. And we got back to our compound and we were notified that they were picking a group to go to Shanghai. They would be involved in the evacuation of Allied personnel from the city of Shanghai. And they were selecting people. And we were going to buy a troop ship, but we're going down to Shanghai. 
I personally was one of those people selected. Electricians, plumbers, engineers, everything. And they were line companies, so forth. They put a group together and we went by troop ship from St. Tile down to Shanghai. Well, there's a map and I can pretty well explain it because it, it, it's close memory. We go down to Shanghai, there's a river that comes from the ocean up towards Shanghai called the Yangtze River. We go up the Yangtze River, we hook a left on what was known as Huang Pu Creek. And our troop ship went in there and we pulled up and anchored at a dock and it went immediately to work, setting up temporary housing, water purification. They had these 2,000 gallon baths on the dock where they were, three of them, where they were purifying water, you know, whether for bathing or, or drinking and so forth. Plumbers were busy, electricians, we put up uh, tents, uh, tables, God knows what else, on that dock for American personnel when they left the city would come there and then go by ship from there back to the United States. Unfortunately, there was nothing for me to do. Uh, the, electro the refrigeration was handled by the troop ship. So uh, there was nothing on shore that I had to do with refrigeration. So I just went menial task. I went in to help here and there during the day. And we were going to be there 30 days. 30 days and we would go, we'd go back to St. Tom. Well, one of the officers on our troop ship had played football in the university, or played basketball at the unit University of Kentucky. And I brought some of this stuff you'll see, news articles. He saw that there was a tournament, basketball tournament, in the city of Shanghai. And if you had a team, you could apply for the tournament. So he said, if I can get enough Marines together, I'll we'll, we'll join that group and, and uh, we will uh, go on that tournament. And there are tryouts. So I tried out for that team. And lo and behold, I made it. Because I could run and I could shoot. And uh, making a layup is not very difficult if you outrun everybody around you. But uh, I made the team. We had practice. And I think we played three or four tournament games getting up to the championship. It was an exciting, it was an exciting team. And we, we got beaten in the final, I've got the article on it. The guy that was responsible for beating us, or we'd won it all, was a guy by the name of Daki Po. He was a businessman in Shanghai who had attended Stanford University and had played basketball for the Stanford University. And he was just a little bit more than we could handle. But we had a great experience. Now, while we were there, one thing that I vividly remember, and I'll recall just shortly, there was a, there was a, when we crossed from the suburbs on our dock, we had to go over a bridge. They called it the American, they called it International Bridge. There was a hotel there, about 12 stories high, and a creek or a channel in there. And in that channel were probably 500 sampans. A sampan is a Chinese houseboat. Mm -hmm. And they were locked in there so tight, if you could walk across their docks from one shore to the other. Out just at the foot of that bridge was a tavern. We liked to go up there on our way and stop and maybe have a beer or something. And the thing we liked about it is the waitresses were what we called white Russians. They weren't communists. They were the non-communist personnel were called white white Russians or whatever in, mm -hmm. in Shanghai. And the waitresses were white. 
there were white women, and we never, we, we hadn't seen any white women in St. Al, so it was a nice spot to drop in and have a, a beer or two. And while we were there, one evening, some British sailors dropped in. They came in out of the blue, and it turned out, and this is something I often wondered if it ever made international news. The British Navy was located in Hong Kong. They decided to run two light cruisers up the Yangtze River to two cities called Nanking and Peking. Now the Red Communists now have changed the names of those two cities. There's something different. But in my day, they were Nanking and Peking. Those two light cruisers were going up that river and the Red Army took field artillery pieces, lined them up on the shore, and leveled them off, and breach aimed, and tried to blow those two light destroyers out of the water. I remember visibly the one was the HMS London, and the London went up through and took several shots in the side, went up the river, now they had to turn around and come back, and got hammered again. Those were the ones that those British sailors came up. The other light cruiser saw what was happening and looked for refuge behind an island. And unfortunately, when they did, they ran ashore on a sandbar. But at least they didn't get shot at. Now they claim that that light destroyer waited until the tide came up the Yangtze River from the ocean, enough so that they, they were able to back up the sandbar retreat down the river and go to Hong Kong. The London came in and docked just above us, and we got to see it the following day. It had holes in it, probably four or five down the side of it, the size of 12 to 15 inches. And what they were there for was an emergency dry dock to weld patches on those holes in the size of that destroyer so they could limp back to the ocean and eventually go to Hong Kong, which they did. And that was an amazing part of that experience. Now, in that same time, that hotel next to us, Chiang Kai-shek put sandbags and machine guns out on the balconies. He was going to defend the city of Shanghai to the last soldier. That was the word we got. Uh, I never got out on the suburbs, but they tell me they had beautiful homes out there owned by American, French, and German that they dug foxholes in their lawns because they had homes out there with businessmen. I never got out there, but I heard that. Anyway, curfew was one o'clock. All of a sudden, Curfew went to 12, then it went to 11, and then it went down to 10, and it eventually came down to 7. Anybody caught on the street after 7 was shot without question, so we stayed on our ship. Now, all those sand pans up in that little channel, lo and behold, they got up one morning and they said to it, They've all disappeared. The people on those houseboats knew what was coming, and somewhere disappeared into the night, into the Wang Fu Creek, and God only knows where they went, but they were gone. That channel was empty. We looked up from our ship, and on the other side of the creek, here was a Chinese transport drifting down the creek, attempting to load their soldiers on the move up the landing nets onto their troop ship. And we got a kick out of it because every once in a while a guy fell in water and had to be pulled up. But nonetheless, Chiang Kai-shek and his army beat the Marines out of Shanghai. He never fired a shot and they were gone. Well, we got the word, we got to clear out. 
people on the docks and everything we had, we started evacuation. Went on to our troop ship. We went down to the mouth of the Wangfu Creek and the Yangtze River and docked. We had two light destroyers down there and a presidential liner, the Wilson, was also docked down there. They sent word back up into the city. Anybody that's got a last minute decision to leave, we'll pick you up and bring you down on the Wilson and take you back to the United States. They said they'd give them three days. I don't know if anybody ever took advantage of it. The general consensus was the Americans and the people had decided they'd weather the storm and they'd be able to adjust to the Red Army, which didn't happen, mm -hmm. as we all know. And we stayed there three days. And then departed and we went back to Sing Tao. And we no sooner had gotten back to Sing Tao, we were told to pack up, we were leaving. And uh, it was quite an evacuation procedure. We loaded about everything we could. I was told to destroy those seven refrigeration units. And which was no difficulty, you know, uh, destroyed some of the components and they were incapacitated. But we packed everything. And up on the hill, we had two large generators, bigger than freight cars. They supplied the electricity for our compound. They had to shut those down and get them through the narrow streets of Sing Tao down to the harbor and load them on ships. And it was a great difficulty. Needless to say, as time went on, we closed everything down. We were living on K rations and generators. That's until we got aboard a ship. And I remember all the stuff that I had that had to be packed it was going on the ship. We came down and we boarded a, we boarded a troop ship. We had a part of Task Force 57 in the harbor. Aircraft carrier, destroyers, and whatever. And we loaded up and we're down there in the harbor and we're aboard ship. And we look up and we see the airplanes coming from our air base, the Marine Air Base, are flying over us and landing on our aircraft carrier. They no sooner had gone over us than there was an alert. Man your battle stations. This is no drill. The Chinese Red Army landed their planes on our air base with no incident whatsoever. They saw us take off and leave. They landed on our air base. And that was what the alarm was. They quietly came in and brought their air force in on our air base. From there, we went to Japan. And we got a three-day leave where we could come off the troop ship. I think we're, if I remember, we were in what they call Yakuska. Uh, some of those cities have been renamed in Japan. And we were allowed to go to Tokyo and to various places. And well, we were like tourists. Mm -hmm. We spent three days there. We get back on the ship and we're going back to the States. And Jimmy Howard was from Huntsville, Alabama, was one of our Marines that I had extended my enlistment with. He was in a bunk next to me as we're going back to the States. And he said, when I get back, I'm going to complain to the Marine Corps. They did not hold up their part of the contract. We were supposed to be in the Western Pacific for two years. And we were only there 18 months. So they didn't uphold their part of the bargain. And we kind of chuckled, you know, okay. We got back to the States. 
and I was sent back in the field as a demolition instructor to infantry company. We showed them how to lay landmines, mm -hmm. booby trap, and whatsoever. We went back more than a week or so, and Jim Howard came to me and said, we're going up, I'm going to take the morning off and go up to division headquarters and file a complaint. You want to come with me? I said, why not? So I took a morning off and we went up, and they filled it out, they typed the, our complaint out, and they kind of chuckled at us. Nobody ever heard of anything quite like that. Hmm. We go back, and I go back to work in the line company. The other guy, one of the other guys that had gone with us, Ralph Burton, he was from Collinsville, Pennsylvania. He found out there was a great, promising light heavyweight in, uh, in the boxing world by the name of Irish Bob Murphy. And he was a left-handed boxer. He was fighting in the cow fouls. And there was a big fight, and we could get tickets to it. So we took a half day leave, put on our civilian clothes, and we're going into Los Angeles to watch the heavyweight fight. This is an amazing story. We're walking towards the main gate, which is about a mile or so. Down the road comes a Marine by the name of Rocky Rasil. I had played football with him in China. Kenyon. You got a hell of a break. They canceled your one year extension. You're getting out of the Marine Corps. He was a, what they call in those days, a runner for the division, mm -hmm. carried communication back and forth. And apparently he had read it. He said, You're going back. You're going to be discharged. We go in and saw the fight. Stopped and had a few beers and came back. Two days later, they called me in and said, you're all done. you got to start packing your stuff and getting ready. You're going back to Great Lakes, Michigan, to be discharged. Your extension has been busted. I got to leave, I think it was 15 days, packed my stuff and went back to my hometown. I got into my hometown, Wayne. I was a pretty good athlete. Mm -hmm. Guys in those days in little towns didn't go to college. You know, they went out to work for it. There was a guy in my hometown by the name of Jack Sullivan. Dad was a principal. He had gone to Springfield College. He played basketball and he had gone out into the coaching world for a few years down in Marlboro, Maine. Came out of there and went back to his hometown and went in business, uh, doing something. But he was an alcoholic. He had had some problems. But when I hit town in uh, October of 1949, he said to me, you got to go to college. Go back and complete your high school senior year, take a couple of subjects, and apply at Springfield College. You can go down there and play three sports. He thought that's as good an athlete as I was. So I went over to school and enrolled in English and in chemistry courses towards a high school degree. Once I got them in that spring, I was working here and there, odd jobs. Once I got my high school degree, I applied at Springfield and I was accepted. Lo and behold, I'm accepted in 1950. In the fall of 1950, I go to Springfield College. I go out for football. There was 130 guys went out for it. And lo and behold, I look back and I said, boom. And I look at it today. There's two guys that changed my life. Jimmy Howard got that extension broken. Mm -hmm. Jack Sullivan got me to go to college. And I look back at those guys that are so responsible for what happened for the rest of my life. I go to Springfield, I make the freshman team. I end up being a starter. North Korean War works out. I had joined 
the Marine Corps Reserve when I got discharged. Only for one reason. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Did I want to go back in the Marine Corps? Or did I want to go to refrigeration school in Iowa? Mm -hmm. So I joined the reserve to keep my meager rank of corporal. I was deferred in the fall of 1950. I was deferred again in the winter term. Uh, I went to classes and so forth. But they did not defer me in my spring term. I was called back to duty. I went from there back to Camp Lejeune. And it was the Marine Corps called their people back and I was down there. Did very little. There was nothing really for me to do down there except be a Marine. We went on divisional uh, maneuvers down to Viegas, up the course of Puerto Rico, and I spent a year there. About the only thing I remember of any consequence were two things. The North Korean War, when I got there, was at its closing. And some of the Marines from our engineering battalion were back in Camp Lejeune. So I went to visit them. They had come back to the States and then been called by the Marine Corps into the conflict in North Korea. And you're aware of this, I'm sure. That engineer battalion that I was in was pressed into service with the Marine Corps and caught in the Cho Sin Reservoir massacre. You are you aware of that? Two army units left the Marine Corps up there where they had to fight their way back up. That battalion of engineers that I was in had 80 seven percent casualties. They, you know, the, they brought them out on the hoods of the jeeps. And very likely, if I had not gone back to high school, had not gotten that extension broken, I would have been one of those victims coming out on the hood of a jeep. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Jimmy Howard. Now that cost me two years and a college degree, because I, you know, I, I lost that spring term and there were conflicts and schedule and so, so forth. I lost a year down at Camp Lejeune, plus trying to find out the things that I had to do to get a college degree. But nonetheless, I got through that. Uh, I went back to college. Uh, I wasn't good enough to play basketball or baseball there, but I played four years of college football and was a captain in my senior year from a guy who played his football in North China. Hmm. And I, that's where I met my wife, and I, I had met my wife as a girlfriend in 1950, and we eventually got married in late 1951. Uh, she was a gal that worked for Mass Mutual Insurance Company in Springfield, Mass. And the rest was pretty much history. Uh, we're married, we've been married 65 years. We have five children, a daughter and four sons, and the four sons eventually ended up playing for their, playing for their father, who coached all those years in, in uh, New York State. We have 14 grandchildren and 14 great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Now, where you want me to go from there, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> now, you, you've got some photographs. Did you want to... I've got... Now, you saw this map yep. of Shanghai. Somewhere, Wayne, there's two action photos of me playing football and synced up. Mm -hmm. And my daughter's still looking for those. These are two pictures of me 
Oh, okay, can you can you hold them up right in front of you sure. like this? And I can, I can try to zoom in on them. Yeah, those are two photos of me uh, outside the barracks in St. Cal. Okay. All right. This is a photo with me and another Marine on maneuvers the second time I got called back, you know, to Camp Lejeune in the reserve. This okay. is up in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. This is a picture of the compound, compound area where we were, where we were uh, stationed. Okay. This is the football banquet <laughs> ah. of our football team in North China. Okay, now if, photo. I was going to say if you, all right, hold, hold it just like that. That's, okay. That's a, that's a photo of that Shantung University. Oh, okay. Pretty good size. Yeah, it was a German built. It was beautiful. I'm trying to see what this was. Oh, Black Market, same towel. <laughs> I did business with him. Uh huh. I had to go down and buy Chinese motors. Okay, hold on just a second. I this. Uh, go ahead. This is a picture of a collapsed roof of the gymnasium in Shantung University, where I played basketball. The roof just collapsed one night. I had been in there playing basketball at 9 o'clock. Huh. It collapsed about 1 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Now let me see where we go from here. This okay, hold, hold, hold that closer to your chest. And, this uh, is a team picture of our football team in North China. Haitian S. Battalion. Hold it right there. Pretty good sized team. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, tell you, a lot of Marines. Okay. I'd say half enlisted men, and the other half were officers. Okay. Picture. All right, hold it closer to you. It's easier for me. That's to... our team. So, whoops, wait a minute. Tail back and the end of it is Bud Kenyon. Okay, hold, hold it right there. Okay, well, that's a great shot. Okay. Now, once you got out, did you uh, did you uh, stay in contact with any of the guys you were in service with? I got a story to tell one of you, but shut that thing off, and then you can tell me where to go back to. Can you shut that yep. off in a minute? Yep. Hold on.
Okay, you st uh, started to tell us about uh, some of your accomplishments and achievements. Yeah. Here's one of the things I overlooked. There's a book out on the market. Okay, if you ho hold it up in front of you and I'll, I'll zoom in on that. Okay, and who's in that picture? There is a book out on the market. It's called Charlie, Two Shoes, and the Third Marines, or the Six Marines, I'm not sure. Okay. It He's one of those houseboys that was involved in that migration to St. Michael's. Okay, uh, can you hold that up again? Cause let me get a better shot of that, if I can. Yeah, hold, hold it right there. And that tells about the book? Anyway, my son Chris, this Charlie Two Shoes, okay, he was one of the... these Chinese mascots. Okay. He got imprisoned over there when he was in that Dunbar school. Uh -huh. Because he spoke English, he went to prison. Really? By the Red Army. He eventually escaped. And somewhere got himself into this country down to Chapel Hill, Carolina. He's a wrestling owner. And he wrote a small book uh -huh. on his experiences with the Marines. My son Chris got the book. Mm -hmm. He called him and uh, told him about his father and so forth. And he said, My father had a, a, a houseboy. His name was Jingle Bells. Charlie Tushu sent this picture to him. Said, I, he said, I knew Jingle Bells, but I didn't know some of the others. Hmm. Well, I got this picture, and the more I look at it, yep. the more I don't think it's Jingle Bells. Even though it came from Charlie Tushu. Uh -huh. Because this guy here looks too big and too old. Okay. And Jingle Bells would never be that old leaning against the Jeep because we were out of China. Mm -hmm. There were no Jeeps in China. But anyway, that Charlie Two Shoes is out there and Mike Gar uh, the guy Mike Gargano's name is in Chicago has the book right now reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's a lot of it is similarity to what you and I I don't know. I read excerpts in the book. I didn't read the whole thing completely. I picked different chapters and so forth. When it comes back to me, which eventually it will, I probably will sit down and read it. I have macular degeneration, so I have a terrible, my wife does the driving. Mm -hmm. most of it. I could, I suppose, drive, but I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a $3,000 machine that the VA has given me that allows me to read all this stuff. The newspaper, books, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I spend a lot of time at that, at that, uh, at that machine. And, uh, anyway. Now, do you belong to the Marine Corps League, or? No, I don't belong to, I even gave up my membership to the American Legion. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but when the time came to renew it, I didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I never belonged to the VFW, yeah, although I was eligible for it. Uh, in my hometown, in Little Bristol, there was an American Legion, it wasn't mm -hmm. very big. Now they have a big, beautiful American Legion in my hometown. And uh, the VFW in my hometown up there is non existent. But, uh, no, I've never gotten. Now, you mentioned going back to college. Did you do that through the GI Bill? Yes. Okay. I, had, I was eligible both GI Bills. Mm -hmm. You know, the World War II and the Korean thing. Now, what did you end up getting your degree in? Uh, physical education, mm -hmm. Bachelor of Science. And then when it, once I got out into the work world, I had to get my master's, mm -hmm. which I eventually, I think I got my master's in North Adams State, you know, because I was coaching at that time 
and who's at fault. So you were a physical education teacher? Yes. I coached. Uh, my first job, when I came out of college, my head coach in college always prided himself on getting his, his co-captains uh, prime jobs. Mm -hmm. And I, I was told I, I was eligible to go to Middlebury College. Assistant football, assistant basketball, assistant track, or Colby College in Maine, same capacity. Job paid twenty seven hundred dollars a year. What year would that be? Uh, that was uh. nineteen fifty six. Okay. Uh, Howard McMullen was a placement director for Springfield. And for some reason, he loved me. He said, I got a job for you. Little school outside of Utica, New York. You can coach football, basketball, baseball, and be the athletic director. It pays $3,750 a year. You'll be the highest paid graduate out of Springfield, you know, non doctor. And I had, of course, we had a daughter in there. Mm -hmm. My daughter was a baby. I took it. I was there three years. And it was a good one. I, the two things that I look at in that, that gave me a little background, foundation. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't, I was there and it was, I had a couple of shots at other jobs that I didn't take. And the job opened up in Hoosick Falls. And the superintendent of the schools wanted me. He wanted, they were in the bottom of the barrel. They'd been thrown out of the league. They were losing and everything. They had a terrible event. Had a terrible facility. Uh, they had seven outlying uh, buildings for the elementary. And three of them didn't even have running water. Of course, now they got a beautiful school over there, was it called? But what he was looking for was a head football and basketball coach who was a Marine drill instructor. He wanted that place straightened out. And I went and met with him, and lo and behold, crazy as I was, I said I'd take it. And the rest, that was the, that was the foundation of my coaching career. Mm -hmm. I found out. I could teach, and I found out I could communicate. And uh, I went through those. I was there six years. In 1965, I was told to apply to the head football job at Gilderland High School, and, uh, which I did. Mm -hmm. And I became their head football coach. 1965, and the only reason I got that job is my accomplishments in in Hoosier Falls. Uh, over the years, I ran clinics and seminars for football. I brought in visiting lecturers and so forth. Mm -hmm. I don't think of all the years I did it, 16 years. I think I only smoked once. I just the rest of the time I got college, high school, NFL coaches. Come in lecture to the coaches in what we call Section Two, which which is all the way from here all the way to Whitehall. And uh, I had an awful lot of accomplishments and achievements over the years, which I'm grateful for, for two reasons. One is the Marine Corps, and the second is the game of football. Mm -hmm. They were awful good to me, both of them, uh, which I always will be indebted to. There's no, there's no mistake in it. Uh, uh, I look back at now, I just, as I look back at my life, you know, I, I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I met some awful good people. Unfortunately, Wayne, the majority of the people that I've been involved with, I've 
outlived. When I went to Gilliland, I inherited nine coaches. Modified, freshman JV, and varsity level. I'm the only one still alive. Wow. Now you retired from Gilderland? Yes. What year did you retire? I retired in 1983. I came out of retirement. Uh, I was living in Casino Lake, the other up north by Argyle. I had retired and we moved up there. And the coach from Greenwich came to me and begged me to come out and help him. Mm -hmm. with his program. So I went down and I worked two years with John Fenwick as a non-salaried coach. And then he retired and they didn't have anybody and I said I'd help him for a year. Mm -hmm. That was 1990. I said I'll help you for one year while you find somebody. Well I stayed there four years as a salaried coach. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, that wasn't like Hoosier Falls, and it wasn't like Gilderland because when I was in those schools, I also was a teacher. So you're with your students and, and with your players 182 days a year. Uh, you get to see them come in in the morning, you get to find out if everything's going okay, or they're having trouble at home, or whatever. But when you're a non teacher in the school, I call them rent coaches You don't get involved in the halls with your students. Mm -hmm. Although Greenwich was a good experience. I did that for, uh, actually, a total of six years in Greenwich. Then I went from, I did go over and help Salem as a non-salaried coach a couple of years because I was asked to help. Mm -hmm. That's all. It wasn't anything I you know, that I jumped at, I just said, I'll give you, I'll give you some help. And uh, that pretty much sums up my, my life, but I had some, I had some great achievements, some great accomplishments, and a lot of things I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. And funny part of it is, if you're successful in the coaching rank, and you become legendary. You become legendary because of the people you coach. Now they'll tell you how much you've done in, in behalf of their lives. But if there wasn't for their, you know, being outstanding players, who the hell would ever heard of Bud Kenyon? You know? Uh, and I hear from players, I've been involved in two two uh, football reunions with players, well, actually four, two in Gilman and two in Music Falls, where players come together, mm -hmm. you know, and we just have a great experience. But that would never happen if they were not quality players and I was a good enough coach to, you know, mm -hmm. benefit from it. Well, I'm sure you had a lot to do with their development. Well, I'll tell sure. you that. I get uncomfortable huh? with it. I tell them it's a two-way street. Uh -huh. you know, uh, I know that uh, one of my former players is an attorney over in Saratoga, Jack Clark. Played for us in 1968. Jack had a reunion of former players in Colony. We had over a hundred former players attended it. They came from everywhere. Down in the Boston area, locally, Florida, Texas, California. Uh, Eddie Elsey even flew in from Olympia, Washington to attend that uh, reunion. And uh, was very emotional, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. But I'm very grateful that I had the benefit of coaching those people. And one of the things I don't want to sound like I'm on a soapbox, but one of the things about if you're in this racket long enough, 
number one, I think, is seeing what happens to your players once their eligibility runs up. Once when they no longer can play the game and they've gone out in the world, what have they done with their lives? Mm -hmm. And that I'm very proud of. I, I look back at all the people I've coached. I've got one that's, that's an alcoholic. He was a brilliant player. And he's fighting the, he's fighting the devil now, you know, just trying to get his family back. And that's one. I got hundreds of them that have done great things with their lives, which I'm so proud of. I tell the story about two of them. When I was in Gilliland, I had a young man that played tackle for me. He went to RPI, played football there. He had to be pushed, and uh, his dad was a great guy. Anyway, he kind of went out in the world, I forgot all about him. Then I got word. Coach, I just got back to Norfolk. Oh, I want you to know I'm a commander of a nuclear submarine. We just spent six months under the Antarctic ice. I said, I wouldn't even step on a submarine, <laughs> you know, for claustrophobia. And uh, he ended up being the commander of our entire, our entire nuclear submarine force in the Pacific Ocean. That's something to be awful proud of. Sure. That, you know, he's just a country boy. Mm -hmm. The other one was in Hoosick Falls. Father was a bum. Mother was non-existent. I took him home half the time from practice. Just a derelict of a kid. But he was a kid the rest of the guy's life. And he played football. He wasn't much of a football player, but he was a scrapper. I lost track of him when I went to go. He was going to quit school and join the Navy. I told him if he did, I'd shoot him. Get a high school degree first. Then do something. Well, he stayed in school after I left and got his high school degree. He went to the Air Force, became a mechanic, spent a couple tours in Vietnam. And when he came back from the Vietnam War, he was stationed in San Antonio, Texas. Then came up on the board. If interested, you can apply to be a mechanic on Air Force Two. So he flies for it. His name was Billy Kelly. Fly for it, and doesn't he get it? Four year tour of duty on Air Force Two. So he's a mechanic on Air Force Two. We got to see all of our vice presidents and everything else. Mm. At the end of the four years, he's back, he's supposed to go back to duty. They liked Billy Kelly so much. They made him a mechanic on Air Force One. That had never been done before, and it's never been done since. So he spent eight years a mechanic on Air Force Two and Air Force One. He saw all our presidents and everything else. Hmm. He's still alive, he lives down in Texas. He's a marathon runner and all this stuff, retired from the, Air, from the Sheriff's Department in San Antonio. But that's a great story. What Definitely. you can do with your life if you got him. And he had nothing going for him. And I get a call from him every six months. How are you doing, Coach? I'm so proud of him. It's so, it's so rewarding to see people you have coached do something with their lives. You know? And I'm so proud of him. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. You don't make a hell of a lot of money in this business. But there's a lot of rewards. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Well, I think I've bent my spleen. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your interview. It's been great. Well, I thank you for taking time with me. 
My you pleasure. You want copies of my discharge and it's done? Yes, I'll make copies of those.